And so we've gone to market owning this term. We're the only ones that really use this term um, simply because we're the only ones that can offer shared truckload because of our technology and our algorithms. And what we're seeing, and so something I look at is, are people searching for it organically? Are people mentioning it organically? And we're seeing that organic searches for that keyword continue to improve, which tells me that, that people are starting to embrace this a little bit more. And also conversations we have with, with prospects, with shippers, uh, even our CEO, when people reach out to him, say, hey, man, I'm really impressed with what you're doing with shared truckload. And when they mention that term without us prompting them, that's a really big win for us because, again, we're changing the industry. We're working on the industry, not in it. And so by changing the industry with new terminology and a new method for freight shipping, that's a really big deal for us and what we're trying to do. Hey, welcome to the show. I'm excited to have here with me today, Jeff Lerner. He's the VP of Marketing at, Fl at Flock Freight, and he's the author of, as he says, the not even close to best-selling book, The Power of Relationships and Professional Growth. And I'm so excited to have you here today, Jeff. I was reviewing your career, really, really pumped about the marketing advice that you'll be able to share here today. And I'm also excited to get to know who you are. I think that uh, in, the, in the age of COVID, and, and even beyond that, uh, this is a good way to sort of, in a way, work the rooms. So virtually other marketers will get to know who Jeff is uh, personally, as well as your incredible, incredible marketing career. So thank you for being on the show, Jeff. Oh, it's great to, to be here. Thanks for having me, James. I appreciate it. So, so tell me about your book. I was looking at it on Amazon. I can't wait to get it. I'll get it after the show, The Power of Relationships and Professional Growth. What inspired you to write that book and how did you go about publishing that? Yeah, you know, it, I always look back and, you know, when, when you're in high school, like you have to take all these classes that, you know, are probably never going to have any relevance to your professional life. I mean, we've all taken you know, bio classes and physics and all these things. And, you know, and I know it's obviously intended to spark interest and help guide you in your careers. And then when you go to college again, like I was in business, you know, program at, you know, at, at George Washington University, but I still had to take more science classes and other things, which I thought were a little bit of a waste of my time. And, you know, in hindsight, you always are like, man, I wish I would have taken a class on like personal finance, like how to you know, manage, uh, you know, your, your bank account, what building credit looks like. So all of those things like you kind of wish you learned earlier on. And I, I sat here a couple of years ago, it, it turned out that, you know, right when, um, after my second kid was born, my wife took my, my older son, you know, during the summer and, and went back to the East coast a couple of times to visit family and friends and, you know, other things. So I had this just kind of empty amount of time. And I've written before for industry publications and, you know, things about marketing and other things like that. And I decided I would just write something that's relatable to the importance of building relationships and how that both realistically helps you in your career, but also the understanding that it's not just a matter of like get connected with someone on LinkedIn and therefore they're going to hire you. Um, so I started kind of writing this, this article and over the course of like the few weeks that, you know, my wife was gone, like I had nothing to do at night and I started just writing and writing and writing. And before I knew it, I was like, okay, this is not an article. This is in fact like a, a, a short book. So you know, it really was just me putting ideas on paper and, and my own perspective on how to, in fact, create your own internal or your, your own inner circle so that you can leverage relationships to help you in your career and your professional growth, that you can do it in the, the most appropriate way possible. It's kind of that things I wish somebody would have told me when I was 22, um, Versus the things that like I was finally able to put on, you know, paper in my late thirties into early forties that, um, you know, we're, we're just more along the lines of 
if you want to build a professional relationship, just how to build it, how to maintain it and how to grow it so that it can help you in your career. That's awesome. So how has that helped you in your career as you implemented these, these tips and advice that you share throughout? Um, you mentioned George Washington University. And if I recall, I read in your history um, or in your bio on Amazon that you specialized in or you received a degree in marketing and sports. Is that correct? Or sports yeah. marketing? What, yep. what was the combination? Yeah, marketing and sports management. Sports management. That's what it was. Yeah. So that's, that's awesome. So going from sports management, can you walk us through how you leveraged the relationship side to get to where you're currently at right now at Flock Freight? What did that look like? And what, uh, what sort of tips may be included in this book? Yeah. You know, I wanted, I always wanted to be a professional athlete and you know, but by the time I was probably, you know, 16, it became abundantly clear that that would never happen. Um, you know, and so what I then, you know, sports have been a passion. So, you know, at this point, like late nineties, you know, Jerry Maguire comes out and I was like, oh yeah, I could totally <laughs> be a sports agent. That seems like a great idea. Like I would love to be Jerry Maguire. Um, that was a popular and- dream. Yeah, especially you know, those, like those movies coming out. <laughs> it seemed awesome. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, so I went to school and, you know, I, I always knew I wanted to be in, on, the, on the business side. And so, of course, you start with just taking more general, you know, business management classes. But I really started getting into the marketing side, like the idea of trying to convince someone to buy something or consider a product that they may not have considered previously. You know, it, it's... I look at it as like a little bit of psychology. Like, how do you convince someone to do something that you want them to do that they may not know that they want to do? And I really enjoyed that element of it. You know, how do you build a brand? How do you do all those cool things? And so marketing became a part of what I wanted to study. But I also didn't want to close the door on the sports world and considered what it would be like to be an agent or to work for a professional sports organization. So, you know, the sports management side, you know, was part of, of my degree kind of just there to, to, to keep all avenues open to me down the road. Um, you know, it's my career, you know, didn't start off in any way related to the sports side of things. Um, but, you know, it certainly allowed me as, you know, so I started at, you know, working at Google back in 2004, did that for a couple of years, you know, in, internally, and then I had an opportunity within Google itself to start working on a, on a kind of a sports and entertainment team and really working with sports teams, sports leagues to, you know, help them, as you were mentioning, you know, before we, we you know, we, we started talking about AdWords and building businesses that way. I was working with, you know, ESPN, the NFL, you know, those types of uh, organizations to build their online presence using Google's tools. So how all that relates to the, to the book um, you know, it, it, it doesn't, you know, in, in a direct kind of connection way. Um, but what the book really, you know, taught what I put in the book, which, you know, are the things that I learned, you know, throughout this time and throughout my, my growth, uh, in my profession was if you want to be talked about when you're not in the room, you know, the idea that if, if two people were sitting at a table saying, oh, man, I really need to hire a world-class marketer. If you want the other person to say, you know what, I know the person you should talk to, it's Jeff, it's someone else, you know, then you can't just be connected on LinkedIn. It can't just be, um, you know, a, a passing relationship. These have to be cultivated, nurtured relationships that require effort that require, you know, kind of collaboration. It's a two-way street. It can't just be, you expect someone to talk positively about you if you never even mention them. Um, so the, the book was kind of taking all of those things, which I did not know. And I, you know, again, like in my early twenties, you know, late twenties, like I just assumed that if I was connected with someone on LinkedIn or had crossed past paths with them professionally, that they would speak highly of me. And that's just not the way the world works. And so I put a lot of thought into 
just trying to give advice of here's how to build those better relationships. And also most importantly, don't just look for those who have the same background as you. You know, I, I, I'm connected with a lot of marketers, but some of my most important connections or, or my inner circle, if you will, are not marketers. You know, they have varying backgrounds, different skill sets than I do, which allows me to learn from them, them to learn from me. And so when they're facing their own challenges and they have a marketing question, they know to come to me versus if they're a marketer themselves, like they don't need me. Um, so there's a lot of these things, again, kind of going back, like the things I wish I knew back when I was, you know, getting my professional career off the ground. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, I, I can't wait to read that book, and I'm 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 excited that uh, that we had the chance to to talk about it here a, a little bit on the show. Let's let's move into a, a, a little bit if if you don't mind. Let's move into uh, Flock Freight. What what's going on at Flock Freight? I love learning about other other industries. Like you said, it's good to be connected to a variety of people, and I think that the, that's one of the biggest value adds to the show. Is I'm hoping to hear from the most nichiest of niche <laughs> out there, the B2B side, the B2C side, um, a variety of people. And I think that uh, you being in the inaugural um, set of shows that, that, that go live here is really, really exciting because I think this will really showcase the power of that. So what's exciting that's going on at Flock Freight and where are you guys going in the future and what does that future look like? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I had the opportunity to join Flock Freight about a year and a half ago um, when the company was, was you know, going through a rebrand, um, you know, kind of really looking to, to get our, our growth, you know, kick that into high speed. Um, what Flock Freight does, which, you know, is different than any other freight provider in this country, is we use technology and algorithms to create what are called shared truckloads. So without boring you with too many details about the way freight moves in this country, um, you know, think of it this way. If you're shipping uh, a package to your grandmother across the country, you put it in a box, you bring it to the post office, you drop it off, your, that package is going to go from post office to the, the local distribution center. From there, it's going to go to multiple distribution centers or warehouses, you know, along the way it gets put on trucks, taken off trucks, loaded and unloaded multiple times until it reaches uh, your grandma's house. Um, now, if you're shipping your grandma like a, a scarf that you knit, then it's no big deal that it gets loaded and unloaded multiple times because it's not going to get damaged. It's a scarf. Um, if you are shipping your grandmother like a fragile piece of you know glass that you've blown because that's your your new hobby is, is glass blowing, then you know what, like the fact that your shipment gets loaded and unloaded and, you know, moved from truck to truck it is probably putting you at higher risk of damage. And that's the same in the freight world. If you have a shipment of, you know, a couple of pallets of goods, it's going on what's called the LTL hub and spoke. It's getting loaded and unloaded multiple times from warehouse to warehouse to warehouse. What we've done is said, you know what, instead of doing that, we can create, using technology, we can create shared truckloads, meaning we will pool freight together. So if there's a shipment in San Diego, if there's another bunch of pallets in, in LA, and then some more in Las Vegas, and they're all delivering to the East Coast, our technology can tell us, you know what, go to San Diego, pick up the freight, drive to LA, pick up the freight, drive to Vegas, pick up that freight, cut across country and make the deliveries, you know, in Chicago, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia. So we allow shippers who have freight of any size to get a full truckload experience, meaning their freight gets picked up. It stays on the same truck from pickup to destination. It doesn't get loaded and unloaded multiple times. So it saves a lot of damage. Freight gets delivered on time uh, and it just provides a better experience for those shippers. So we're the first and only ones that are doing that. Uh, it requires a boatload of technology and algorithms that are way too advanced for my, you know, understanding. And that's why we have incredible engineers uh, who, who solve those types of problems. Uh, I just get the benefit of, of talking about it. That's awesome. So on your side, on the marketing side, you're the head of marketing there. 
who is your ideal audience for that? For example, I, um, 10 or 11 years ago, I ran an affiliate website that sold log splitters. And, and the way that we did that is, is I, was, I was personally on the phone sometimes. I would pick up the phone because people would call to order a two to $4,000 log splitter. And we had to ship those through freight. And um, as an affiliate, I had to work in the freight prices and, and freight structure and whatnot. Is, is that the type of customer you're going after? Or are you going after more of a commercial who, who is that customer for you guys? Who's, yeah, who's so the best customer? We're, we're a B2B company. We work with a lot of companies, both, you know, some that, that ship, you know, 25, 50 times a month to those that ship 25 to 50 times a day. Um, you know, so it, everything from, you know, large companies and, and you know, think of, we, we certainly do have uh, companies that are an ideal fit. For example, if you are shipping, uh, pallets full of pickles, jarred pickles, um, you really want to avoid damage because you break one jar in a pallet of pickles, like you have a mess on your hands. That's a big <laughs> problem. Um, that's a great and, example. <laughs> you know, and so like, that's an ideal customer for us. Like your B2B large manufacturer, or I guess manufacturer is probably not the best word, large distributor of pickles. Um, great fit for us. You're, you're uh, those that are shipping building supplies, um, you know, fine foods, all of those things are, I, are our ideal customers because they have fragile freight. Um, while we'd be happy to work with, you know, the largest manufacturer of pillows or ping pong balls, that's not necessarily our, our sweet spot. You know, that's, um, you, you, you don't really worry about pillow damage the same way you would worry about, you know, pickles or, you know, industrial machinery. Yes. That, that, that makes sense. So how are you reaching those customers in that prime moment when they're ready to buy? So, you know, our business is, is, a, is a little bit less about like point of sale, you know, um, trying to get them at, at that moment in time. Um, that's okay. certainly, I mean, it's part of our business, you know, smaller shippers, uh, that's, that's the way they live. Like they wait until like their loading docks are getting full or they have an order that gets placed and they have to move it. Uh, in which case they come that, you know, we have an online, you know, app that they put in their shipment details, you know, we give them an instant quote and they can, you know, secure their freight that way. At the most part, what I focus on as a marketing leader is how do I build the brand? How do I create, you know, the presence, uh, and the reputation in the industry and in the marketplace because then our sales teams, like we're, we're doing, you know, contracted pricing. We're working with large shippers and saying, anytime you have freight that's between, you know, 10 and 44 linear feet that's going from, you know, LA to Chicago, like let's just lock in a price and we will, we will move all of that for you. So it's much bigger strategic business relationships um, mm -hmm. than it is, you know, someone Googling, you know, freight broker, you know, or, or freight yes. provider. That, that makes a lot of sense. So, so what sort of techniques are you using to get your reputation out there and to build that brand? We, we are, I mean, certainly over the last year and a half, we have been very content marketing heavy. Mm -hmm. uh, being an industry thought leader is something that is vital to, you know, our continued growth. Uh, we continue to publish white papers that, you know, touch on all of the different elements of, of the freight world and supply chain, everything from how to navigate you know, supply chain in the middle of COVID and how that's changed things to predictions for, you know, 2021 to, you know, how technology can continue to play an important role in, in managing supply chain. Uh, so we publish blogs, you know, weekly, we have white papers, usually at least quarterly. Um, we do publications and we get, uh, we get articles written about us in uh, industry publications such as Freight Waves and Inbound Logistics so we're, we're really focused on that thought leadership piece. Uh, additionally, we, you know, leverage all the, the traditional kind of B2B marketing techniques, whether it's account-based marketing, you know, using LinkedIn as well. Um, and then we also have a, a heavy PR focus um, because we are changing an industry. As we like to say, we, we're working on the industry, not in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, we we get... A lot of you know, uh, a, a lot of bites from reporters who want to cover what we're doing, given that 
it's completely different than what anybody else in this industry is doing. So we, we certainly want to continue to, to push our media presence. And, you know, the more people write about us and, and the, our reputation continues to build, uh, that certainly continues to help our growth. That's awesome. I really, really loved what you said, working on the industry instead of in the industry. I've, I've heard that on the business side, right? Working on the business instead of in the business as a management or as, as leader. But it's neat to see that magnifying glass shifted to the industry or pulled back, so to speak, on the industry. So that's, that's a brilliant insight, Jeff. I, I, I really, really like that. What, what sort of metrics are you going after with doing all of this work, with the reputation management, with getting published in industry magazines, publishing your own white papers or hosting those white papers elsewhere, or blog posts. Um, with all of that content, what are the metrics that you guys are looking at? Yeah, I mean, we look at, you know, a lot of the traditional metrics that, that marketers would look at. We look at everything from uh, our, our organic website traffic and our growth that we see there. Uh, of mm -hmm. course, we look at, you know, the number of inbound leads that come through and, and you know, our overall cost per acquisition uh, all the way through to, you know, looking at, at you know, the different stages of the leads that we do bring in. Um, you know, on the, uh, on the PR side, we look at share of voice to see how we are stacking up against our competitors in terms of who's writing about us, who's writing about them. Like, where do we, where do we sit in that media landscape? Uh, given that we are a, a smaller company than, than our competition, uh, it, it's always interesting to kind of see how we may be at, you know, a, a 25%, you know, share of voice in, in terms of industry publications um, when, you know, we're certainly not a 25% of the industry. So that's certainly something that we continue to monitor. Um, you know, we're ROI, every marketer, ROI. Sure. That's, yeah. you know, certainly what my CEO asks me every day. What's our ROI? Yes. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Of, of course, it's, it's, it's always about ROI. The sales cycle, though, it, it sounds like the sales cycle is kind of long, but at least you can understand from early in the funnel with share of voice to late in the funnel to when a sales rep is talking to them or an account executive is talking to them. So, so that, that certainly makes sense following that path. What tools are you using to measure your share of voice? Uh, we have a PR firm that they, they have their own tools. So I'm not exactly sure what uh, specific you know, tool that they use to track that. But I get reports mm -hmm. from our PR firm each quarter that you know, we've, we've given them you know, our list of competitors and, and mm -hmm. they put that together in their reporting and show what you know, our, our share of voice looks like compared to the competition. That's awesome. So, so you're willing to source some of this work elsewhere, other agencies, putting together that team um, involves a, a good mix then. Yes. You know, so we, we are a small marketing team. Um, you know, we, we are a, a team of, of now five. I just uh, onboarded someone yesterday. Oh, awesome. Um, so, you know, okay. a team of five. And, and so we're, we're focused on, you know, acquisition of, of, customers we're focused on the brand and continuing to build that we have two content writers so like i said very heavy in the content marketing space mm -hmm. uh, we have a growth marketing manager someone who's there to help us retain and grow our existing customer base and then we do you know outsource or, or partner um you know is, is a better word partner with a pr firm that you know has that expertise in, in growing media relationships understanding that landscape uh, and getting our name out there, whether it be, you know, the, the, the write-ups we've had in Forbes or TechCrunch or some of the other publications. That's awesome. Wow. Very cool. Very cool, Jeff. So within Flock Freight or actually even pulling back to your entire career, what has been your all-time most favorite campaign, most successful campaign that you ever created and built? Oh man, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I would, it, it's, it's hard to answer because throughout my career, there's been different, different things that have led to different outcomes. But so I'll give you two examples. One is when I was at Google and working in the sports and entertainment space, 
Uh, I put together a proposal and a plan and a campaign for ESPN for their fantasy football, uh, their, their fantasy football program, their fantasy football, uh, you know, product. Um, and they had always, you know, at the time ESPN was, you know, certainly in competition with Yahoo sports and CBS sports, and even the NFL's own fantasy football, uh, program. And I put together a program of, of, you know, here's how you're going to leverage AdWords. Here's how you're going to leverage some display marketing, a little bit of YouTube, and we're going to build ESPN's, uh, you know, fantasy football registration considerably, you know, compared to the prior year. And I pitched it to ESPN. They bought in and it was monumentally successful. They saw significant growth, you know, in their registrations, became a very profitable center for them. Obviously, like their retention rates um, were always high. So like, it's, you know, kind of usually people are, are loyal to their fantasy football platforms, mm-hmm. uh, you know, especially because it can carry over your league year after year. So, you know, it was not only a great investment for them in the short term, like they knew it would be a really great return on that investment, you know, long term as well. Um so as a result, I won a couple of awards internally at Google for that, you know, simply because of, of not just the revenue it brought into Google, but just the overall success of that program. So that was a, uh, you know, kind of a big win that I, that I do look back on frequently of, you know, sometimes you got to pitch something big and, and go big and, and, you know, you will find the, the companies and the resources to, to, to make it happen. Uh, the, the other one is kind of what I'm working on now with, with shared truckload uh, at Flock Freight. Um, you know, there are a lot of industry terms. Uh, shared truckload has not historically been an industry term, but we're making it one. Um, you know, th- there's, you know, abbreviations in freight, you know, LTL is less than truckload, TL is just truckload. Um, and we said, you know what, there's something in between, which is, you know, STL, which is shared truckload. So uh, this campaign is still in its infancy in a lot of ways, um, but we're making progress and it's really exciting every day to, to kind of see the way it's transformed. That's awesome, Jeff. I love that tactic. In fact, I think that's one of the gold nuggets of this, this show with you right now is to have people developing terms on the industry in the in the industry for the industry and then sort of trademarking that almost like uh, native advertising somebody coined the term native advertising and it took off and i i think that was share through if i recall correctly but um google practically coined the term pay-per-click advertising yep. with google ads they they really define the industry so sometimes some people can invent the word but then another can define it so you're tackling both where you have invented the term and you're defining it. And I think that's incredible. Um, so, so what did that definition process look like? Were you involved with that, creating that term and perpetuating that term? Can you kind of give us a little behind the scenes look at what that, that looks like? Yeah. So, you know, it's conversations that have happened, you know, from the, you know, kind of when I started at Flock Freight, we, we kept having those conversations of, we offer something different. We have a unique product. Like we, we have, it's, it's named, you know, on our website, we call it flock direct is our shared truckload solution. That's the brand. And, and right? That's the branded yeah. version of it. Yeah. And so throughout the time, like we were having those conversations, you know, I kept on saying like, we need to own this in a different way. This needs to become an industry term that every other company is going, we know inevitably every or, or other logistics providers are going to try and imitate what we're doing. And, and, you know, we welcome that challenge. It's taken us five plus years of nothing but data and uh, algorithm development and technology to get where we are today. And so if, if someone decides they want to jump in, you know, the ring by all means, but it's going to take them a while to get there. And so we wanted to, be out in front and to, you know, create a new mode of shipping because that's what we are doing. We all look at each other and say, we've created a new mode of shipping. So now how do we, you know, besides just the branded version of it, how do we create a industry term around it? So 
I, I, you know, literally said to my team, Hey, let, let's, what, what word here, here's the definition now come up with the word, the terminology. And I made a little contest for my team and said, come up with your ideas and we're going to pick the best one. And um, that's where we landed. You know, one of the, the really talented members of my team said, I, I like the idea of using shared because that's what we do. And, you know, I brought that back to our executive team and said, hey, guys, here's what we think. This is the definition. This is the terminology. And if we were all in alignment and we all agree, we're going to go heavy with this. We're going to include it in all of our marketing messaging. We're going to add it to our website. We're going to write content related to it. We're go- we, we can't, you can't just dabble in it. Like you, you sure. have to own it and you got to really push it. And so that's what we've done. Awesome. So what, what did that first step look like after you won the approval within the company, everybody bought in the first step to owning that term, especially on Google and within rankings, of course, is to publish about it. But what sort of strategy or tactics did you use to say, okay, we are all in on this. The very first thing that we have to do is, is this, what was that? The first thing we did was put it, put pen to paper. We, we wrote clearly the, the, the terminology and the definition and then how it relates to our business. And we shared that internally because the most important thing for us was to make sure that if a sales rep is talking on the phone or, and someone said, you know, mentioned shared truckload or they said shared truckload, that everybody was speaking the same language, that there was no ambiguity on what exactly shared truckload is. So the first thing you know we did was internally make sure we all are speaking the same language. Once we've kind of secured the internal, okay, this is how we're gonna go to market. This is how you're going to see as a marketing team. This is how you're gonna see us put it out there. Now we were able to start putting it, including it into our blogs, you know, doing our, our you know, press releases and other PR efforts where we included that. Uh, made changes to our website where, you know, instead of just saying algorithmically pooled freight, we would, you know, say, you know, we create algorithmically uh, per- pooled shared truckload. So we just started incorporating it into our normal day-to-day vocabulary. Mm-hmm. And now every piece of content we put out, every conversation we have, every press release, every conversation with the media always references shared truckload. I love it. That's awesome. The internal buy-in is, is huge. And it's, it, it's the classic viral situation that way too, right? Because you are the distribution center, so to speak, outside of freight for that term within the industry. So, so yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Man, Jeff, you've dropped some incredible knowledge on us today on the marketing side. So let's, let's talk a little bit uh, about you, about what life looks like for you outside of marketing. What are, uh, uh, earlier on in the call, you, you mentioned you had a couple of kids. Is that, is that two kids, two boys? Did yep. I hear that correct? Two boys. Awesome. Uh, How old six, are they? six and almost four. Six and four. That's awesome. They're getting into uh, school and having a lot of fun, I'm sure. Um, what, uh, I, with, with kids, I've got a few kids of, of my own. And each of their personalities are so different from the next. Uh, I'm, I imagine you see the same. Yeah. So, so what, well, what are their personalities like? What, what are you seeing as far as uh, their early strengths? Is one like a social uh, superpower connector type and the other maybe introverted? Um, or yeah, what, what would you say are your kids' biggest strengths so far early on? You know, my, my, my older son is, you know, just he's in first grade and like he just, he loves to read. He's more than mild mannered, you know, just, I I don't want to say he's just a little bit more, you know, middle of the road in in the sense of, you know, he's calm, cool, collected, loves to read, brilliant at math. I mean, he's every five minutes, he's just throwing out math questions and problems. That's amazing. You know, so like he's already well above his grade level in both reading and math and just a really, cool kid like he loves playing sports we you know play throw throw the ball around in the backyard i coach his little league team um so he's you know like me in that sense like you know all he wants to do is you know be playing playing ball uh out in the backyard um you know and just a a very mild mannered you know kid um 
my three and a half year old, almost four year old is, um, you know, wild, full of personality, you know, goes from the, the craziest of temper tantrums to also like the <laughs> most, um, you know, cuddly, cute, like personable, uh, adorable little kid there is. And so he's just more, more, he's got more emotion, you know, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, well, being three too is quite an adventure. So yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. especially three when like you're home all the time now due to COVID and like, you know, your, your oh, own, man. his whole world is basically like, you know, us and his brother and, you know, so, but just, uh, you know, also like says the sweetest things and, and the, you know, like that makes your heart melt. And then five minutes later is, you know, throwing a tantrum and, and telling you that he's not going to listen to a word that you have to say. So, <laughs> oh man, you know, that's classic. Classic he, for three-year-olds, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's an adventure. Um, that's fun though. You know, and, and if, if I believe my parents, apparently that's what I was like when I was three. So, um, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Yeah. My parents always w would tell me as much of a rebel as I was, especially during the teenage years, they would always say, I can't wait for you to have a kid that's just like you. Y yeah. And, and, and my son, I feel like is kind of just like me. And I'm like, oh, great. I do not want to deal with those teenage years because I know the hell I put my parents through. <laughs> so I get it. That's, a, that's hilarious that they're saying that. That's awesome. Very cool. So, so what are your hobbies like? Are you, are you still in the sports? Do you uh, play, the, of course, fantasy leagues? What is, do, do you have like a favorite go-to sport? You've mentioned ESPN. Um, I saw some work with the NFL also. I, I think that might've been with Google too. Yep. But, uh, but yeah, what's your favorite sport? What are your favorite hobbies? Yeah, so um, I, I do, well, pre-COVID, but I do, I do play ice hockey. And so I still play that. And, and it's just, you know, like adult beer league. Uh, you know, <laughs> That's hockey. awesome, though. You know, not, not don't have the talent to, uh, to do anything else. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I love playing sports with the kids. And like, we, you know, we go out and, you know, especially my older one where I coach Little League. And so I get to, mm -hmm. to really you know, play and throw a ball with him and have a good time. Is that uh, baseball my, for him? Baseball. Yep. Cool. Kids love to watch sports. So we certainly watch a lot of hockey. That's like my sport of, of, of choice. We watch a lot of football. Um, certainly, you know, watching baseball, not really big basketball fans. Um, you know, in terms of hobby, you know, I, 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 during COVID and quarantine, like I, I picked up a hobby of making, uh, kind of like epoxy resin uh, woodworking. Oh, so making yeah. like serving trays and, awesome. you know, I made uh, like some, some nesting tables using wood and different color epoxy and resin stuff. Um, so I kind of have like a little, little tiny spot in the garage that I'm allowed to use for my <laughs> own, my own projects. And so I kind of do that. And, and what I've done actually is I've created uh, an Instagram, you know, for it. And I, anything that I make, I auction off and then I give all the, the proceeds to, to different charities. Oh, that's um, awesome. What, you know, do, do you mind sharing what that Instagram? Yeah, it's, it, it's, uh, it's, it's make wood for good. And there's a underscore in between. So make underscore wood underscore uh, for underscore good. Okay. And awesome. you mind so, if I share that? Yeah, with, no, go, go yeah. for it. In, um, in the in the recap i'll share that awesome yeah cool. and you know it, it's just been it, it's been a, a skill like i don't have a lot of tools so i make everything by hand like they're not perfect mm -hmm. you know pieces like there are so many great talented artists out there that make all these wonderful amazing um you know kind of perfect pieces of of you know of, of wood art um or serving trays charcuterie boards those kinds of things uh and, and i just wanted to learn a new skill and so that's what I do. And then, you know, I, I auction them off to friends and family and, and, you know, they'll, they'll buy them and, you know, I just donate the money to different charities. Um, kind of like my way to, to give back during some challenging times. Sure. Um, I would never want, you know, I, I'm not going to sell them for any sort of profit considering they're also like really talented artists who I follow on Instagram, who this is their job and their profession. And I don't want to take away from them and my work is not nearly that good. So Sure. Uh, you your know. work looks amazing by the way i'm looking at your instagram feed this is very very cool jeff this is awesome i love this side of the people behind marketing this is such a cool hobby that's it's, awesome it's been a lot of fun you know it's it's 
you know, makes me want to like, you know, uh, my, my wife is from Maine and where she grew up, like her, her, you know, her house, they have this huge woodshed, you know, a shop in the, you know, on their property. I mean, it's probably like the size of my house here. <laughs> and, you know, as much as I don't want to leave Southern California, like that's my dream now is I want a big shop so I can make more of these things and have actual tools and, and all of that kind of stuff. But, you know, it's been, it's been a lot of fun to learn, you know, the kids get a kick out of it when I let them choose the colors that, you know, I'm going to use to, to make something. So it's been, you know, just a, a, a I don't know, kind of like a, a feel good way to, to get some enjoyment, you know, over the last couple of months. A fun little hobby. That's awesome, Jeff. How cool. Well, is there anything else you would like to share with us today? I've, I've really, really enjoyed the conversation so far. This is, you've, you've shared some incredible knowledge, loved getting to know a little bit of the personal side of life for you. Um, yeah, any, any last words of advice or thoughts for any marketers or any, any family, family people, family guys, family, yeah, I guess family people is the best word for it. <laughs> <laughs> Men and women who have families that are yeah, doing the same I thing, working a good career and getting by. I would say, you know, and, and I don't, I don't want to plug the book because again, like it, I, I didn't write it to sell it. I mean, honestly, like I've given away more copies of the book than I've sold because it, it was just an outlet for me to put my thoughts down. And so I have friends and family members who are in their, you know, early twenties and just kind of beginning their professional careers. And then, this was just a way for me to send them this and say, Hey, read this. If you get one thing out of it, that's great. Um, and so my, my, my advice is whether it's my book, someone else's book, you know, I, I'm really, I encourage anyone who's early in their career or even like, you know, just mid mid part of their career to, to really think about and understand relationships and how both impactful they can be but also the effort that goes into it. Um, you, you, it can never be a one-way street. It can never be something that you should take for granted. And especially, as I mentioned before, build relationships with those outside of your profession and your company. You know, get to know people. I, you know, accept all LinkedIn requests from people because I simply don't know who I might bump into or, or whatever it is down the road. So connect with me on LinkedIn, find other people who have similar interests. Please drop a note in your request so that people just don't get requests with no context, but say, <laughs> Hey, I'm a marketer. I, you know, I'm, I'm following the work that you do. I'd love to connect just so I can follow and learn more. That goes a long way. And you never know when that leads to something bigger or better than just following or being connected to someone on LinkedIn. So my recommendation to anyone out there is relationships are extremely powerful, personal relationships and professional relationships. So find ways, learn ways, take classes, do whatever needs to be done to continue to build upon that because that will be so instrumental throughout your career that there was no class about it in college. There was no uh, textbook, you know, whatever it is find a way to kind of, you know, learn and understand that skill. I love it. And to, to recap earlier in the show, we mentioned the title of your book, the power of relationships and professional growth. Do you prefer people get that at Amazon or do you have another way, a website that you like people to go to where, where should people purchase this book? Amazon is the only place to, to get it. Um, okay. You know, I, so that I, I self published it, you know, on Amazon. Awesome. So, you know, that's where you can, that you can get it. All right. Uh, so an, uh, an, another place to connect with you, you said was LinkedIn and that is linkedin.com slash in slash Jeffrey Lerner, J E F F R E Y L E R N E R. Is that that's correct? Right. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's been such a pleasure to have you on the show. I'm excited to get this one out. You shared so much good information. Man, this was, this was wonderful. So thank you. Thanks thank again. Thank you for having me. This was a pleasure.